Welcome to a new Synthesis Workshop episode, and thank you, Sarah, for joining us. Sarah Heinos received her Bachelor in Science degree in Chemistry by St. Vincent College. Rapidly, she joined Professor Thomas Montgomery to pursue her PhD in Organic Chemistry, based in Duquesne University. Sarah is currently working as a postdoc for University of Pittsburgh. One of her main interests was the development of sustainable methods to form high valuable products. Thank you, Sarah, and the stage is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here to share our work with the Montgomery Research Group at Duquesne University, specifically on our most recent publication in Organic Letters on 3 plus 2 cycle additions and how we used those to form 1,2-dienes. So nitrogen-containing heterocycles are of interest for our research group because they are privileged synthetic motifs. They're present in a lot of different pharmaceuticals and natural products, and they exhibit a wide range of bioactive properties. So synthetic methods forming these valuable building blocks are highly sought after. One such method is through 3 plus 2 cyclic additions with tertiary amine oxides. That would be the pink part with various different dipolarophiles, that would be the teal part, reacting together to form heterocyclics. So depending on the substrate, pyrrolidines could be formed as well as imidazolidines. This work was established in the 80s by Ruzi and co-workers, and since then it really hasn't seen any other reports in the literature, aside from a one-off publication by Devoren and co-workers at Pfizer, where they used this chemistry building box for their potential pharmaceuticals. So since then, it hasn't seen a whole lot, and what we were really interested in is using this transformation to form imidazolidines. So focusing on that, using their system, this nitrogen-carbon bond is really reaction inert. It's very difficult to cleave. You can't really do much more chemistry with that to functionalize it. So we thought it would be great if we had some type of reaction labile protecting group where you can deprotect it and then do a whole lot of different transformations like alkylation, cross-coupling reactions. So you have aerolations as well as adding on different protecting groups, so tossel groups or even acetyl groups. And you can do so much more with this chemistry because amines are so versatile. So we are looking to use this transformation to make a useful building block to build more complex scaffolds. So for our project, our objectives were to gain a better understanding of the mechanism through computations, and that was done by my lab mate, Martin Neal, as well as to optimize the reaction conditions and once optimized, incorporate different silomines into this 3 plus 2 cycle addition, forming various imidazolidines, just to see what all is possible with this chemistry. So as far as understanding the reaction mechanism goes originally, what was proposed by Ruzi and co-workers is that an initial deprotonation occurs, which kicks off diisopropylamine as well as lithium oxide. This forms a discrete aminium intermediate. And then after another deprotonation by LDA, kick off another equivalent diisopropylamine and the azomethine illid is formed. And this is our reactive species for the cycle addition. So we saw kind of two problems with this. Lithium oxide is a pretty poor leaving group. And the aminium intermediate is super electrophilic. So looking at some of Ruzi's old papers, they used unprotected alcohols in this chemistry. If unprotected alcohols were used, if you have an aminium intermediate, you should see some types of side reactions occur, which they did not report. So that was another thing. And also you could get side reactions with the lithium oxide because it's nucleophilic. You have a nucleophile, you have an electrophile, chances are they will react and form side products, which we didn't see in the crude reaction mixture. So again, my lab mate Martin took a look at this and he found that if you do the initial deprotonation, instead of kicking off a poor leaving group, which is lithium oxide, it, it stabilizes the charge on the resulting intermediate. After another deprotonation by LDA, kick off another equivalent of diisopropylamine, and we form this weird multi-ion bridge intermediate. And this pathway is actually lower in energy by about four kcals per mole. So once we go through this multi-ion bridge intermediate, we form our reactive azomethine illid species. You can form the discrete illid by kicking off dilithium oxide, which is a much better leaving group than lithium oxide. 
And this is interesting because we see that a face of our illid is blocked. This could explain some of the diastereoselectivity that we were observing, and this could be really exciting chemistry if this is in fact diastereoselective. If this was more favorable and based on our experimental observations, the multi ion bridge intermediate is more likely than the iminium intermediate. And if you're interested, you can read more about this in our publication in the Journal of Organic Chemistry. So moving on to how we applied this to new chemistry. So siloamines aren't commercially available, but there are plenty of commercially available aldehydes and the siloamines can be formed quickly and easily through an azo brokery arrangement. This siloamine can then be incorporated into our 3 plus 2 cyclo addition where we formed imidazolidines and they were forming in very clean conversions, but also what was happening whenever we were trying to deprotect the TMS group is that we were seeing hydrolysis of this imidazolidine into 1,2-diamines. And this was kind of surprising, but not all was lost because 1,2-diamines are bioactive in their own right. They're interesting molecules because they're present in a lot of different natural products as well as pharmaceuticals, and they also exhibit a range of different bioactivities. So finding new methods to build these diamines are also of high interest because they're also privileged motifs like the heterocycles that we were originally interested in. Additionally, there are multiple ways to synthesize these diamines. So if we focus on this bond breakage here, this can be formed from an amine and an amino acid. And so this is sort of the layout of how that goes. And the main takeaway is that, yes, this is established chemistry. It's been done many times before, but you're limited to whatever amino acids are available, which there are a lot, so that's not that bad. But it involves three steps where you have deprotection as well as reduction. So you're limited to reduction insensitive functional groups, as well as you might be limited depending on whatever deprotecting method you choose. This is an ongoing area of research. 2022, Hall and coworkers reported a new synthesis with the same disconnection as seen with that old and established method. And they were able to use different building blocks, which is nice because it increases the substrate scope. And it's a rhodium catalyzed directed hydro emanation with a broad scope, which is nice. And they use this carbon nitrogen bond forming reaction. Additionally, looking at this disconnection, Wen and co-workers reported this in 2022 as well, and they had a base promoted diamination. And this was a nice way to install two different amines and form two different carbon nitrogen bonds. And they had a great scope for sulfonium salts, but it's relatively limited because you don't have chemically distinct amines. It has to be two equivalents of the same amine. But this is still an excellent option for forming two carbon nitrogen bonds. And again, they did have a broad scope for sulfonium salts and amines as well. And this is sort of where our method kind of differs is that we form this carbon-carbon bond. And yes, this has been done before forming this carbon-carbon bond to form diamines, but we're using different building blocks and it's kind of a more unique disconnection point. While there are other methods, it's not a widely used, I guess, disconnection for this chemistry. So these are also interesting molecules because you can build them up since amines are so versatile, you can do a lot of different things with them and build complex scaffolds. So we can, again, easily make the heterocycles that we were originally interested in. And arguably this is slightly more interesting because you can install yet another functional group. So another piece to the puzzle, instead of working with two, we're working with three. So we decided to sort of capitalize on this route, even though we didn't make heterocycle that we were originally intending, we decided to run with it with the diamines. So using acid, we were able to hydrolyze the diamines better and an equivalent of formaldehyde is kicked off and we formed the diamines. We found that if we use a formaldehyde scavenger, it works even better. So that's what the hydroxyl amine hydrochloride is doing. And it just results in a better yield and a cleaner conversion. So looking at the optimization of this, these are all isolated yields. We were able to reduce the equivalence of base to two. We were able to get a 50% isolated yield, which isn't bad, but three equivalents of LDA worked the best 
And then looking at different bases, we got no reaction with lithium HMDS as well as sodium HMDS, so we need a stronger base. This is also nice because since sodium HMDS resulted in no reaction, this allowed us to make this method into a one-pot synthetic method. So a lot more efficient than it originally would be since you don't need to purify that imine, even though it goes clean conversion, there's like basically no aldehyde left after that. But it's nice that excess base is not going to hurt the cycle addition reaction since that's the trickier step, if you will. Looking at different solvents, THF still worked the best. Ether wasn't a bad yield for 67%, but it was still lower than just using THF. And letting the reaction go for longer than two hours resulted in a 70% yield, which was slightly lower than the 75% yield. It's really not that much different. And cutting it at just an hour, it lowered the yield to 54%. Our optimized reaction conditions were three equivalents of LDA and THF for two hours, negative 78 degrees Celsius to room time. And interestingly enough, all these were done on a 0.2 millimol scale, but when we scaled it up to a 2 millimol scale, we were able to get a 94% isolated yield with this diamine. So that was really exciting too. So looking at our substrate scope, we found that electron donating groups really worked very well with the reaction. Electronically neutral diamines work very well too. It was exciting for me, at least. Instead of just using a bunch of arrow groups, we were able to incorporate an alkyl group. So we got a 60% yield with the terp-butyl substituent, and we got a 72% yield with an adamantyl substituent. The sort of caveat to this chemistry is because we're using LDA, it's a strong base, and those protons, especially with the imines, are fairly acidic if there's any protons in the alpha position. Alpha protons don't work nearly as well with this chemistry. Um, they kind of kill the cycle addition, but there are plenty of options and there are plenty of workarounds around that. It's just we wanted to demonstrate that, yes, alkyl groups work just as well as aryl groups. Also, excitingly enough, is that with TMS protecting groups, they work well, provided that the steric bulk is farther away from where the cycle addition occurs. So at the ortho position, the TBS protecting group is really bulky, and I am hypothesizing that it's sort of getting in the way of that cycle addition reaction. Whereas at the pair position, the big bulky TBS group is far enough away that we get a decent 77% yield with that. And these are good because the TBS, you can deprotect that alcohol, you can use it as a functional group handle. And you can even make it into a pseudo halide if you convert it to a triflate or something like that. So this was really nice that we could install this group and it worked quite well. With electron withdrawing substituents, this chemistry doesn't work as well. So with the CF3 group at the pair position, we got a 32% yield. At the meta position, we got a 48% yield. And then halides are problematic. So even with the floral group being as poor of a leaving group as it is, we still saw some side reactions occurring and we had to be very careful with the temperature control. So with the fluoro substituent, we had to keep the reaction at from negative 78 to zero degrees and then carefully worked it up and continued on to the diamond formation. Heterocyclics also work with the pyridyl substituent. We got a 15% yield, which is fairly low. The furyl substituent, we got a 56% yield, and with the quinoline substituent, we got a 76% yield, so that was exciting. We also used a different an oxide, so an, an oxide with a phenyl group instead of a methyl group, and we got the terbutyl substituted one in a 69% yield, and at the paramethoxy position, we got a 52% yield. Also interesting is that with the heterocyclics, they actually were more stable as the imidazolidines than the non-heterocyclic substituents. So we were able to isolate this imidazolidine in a 85% yield, and it was stable to moisture and everything like that. So that was nice. And we were able to deprotect it with acid too, and it didn't fall apart. So again, we were able to isolate the imidazolidine. So that was cool. We also did a lot of different functionalizations with this chemistry. Many of these functionalizations were done by my lab mates, Alex and Danny. We wanted to demonstrate that these are useful synthetic building blocks. So we are able to form imidazolines as well as imidazolidinones. And then 
my lab mate Alex was able to get selective functionalization of the primary mean rather than the secondary mean, which we were able to confirm with 2D NMR. The means could be selectively functionalized and we could also build more complex heterocyclics as well. So hopefully these will be useful building blocks, I think. So in summary, we were able to propose a new mechanism based on computations and experimental observations. So again, that multi-ion bridge intermediate is more favorable than the aluminium intermediate and we're effectively blocking aside for the azomethine illid, so that could explain some diastereo selectivity that we're observing. We were able to develop a three-step one-pot synthetic method forming diamines using siloimines and tertiary amine and oxides. And with that chemistry, we we're able to synthesize 21 diamines with yields ranging from 15 to 94%. And we were also able to demonstrate the synthetic utility of these diamines. So we were able to selectively functionalize them and also recyclize them into heterocyclics. With that, I would like to thank my research advisor, Dr. Thomas Montgomery, as well as my lab mates. So Martin Neal did all the computations, Daniel Beers and Alexander Kokolis did the experimental work with me. And I also want to thank our undergraduate students that also helped out with the project as well. So Benjamin Musiak, as well as Marian Hanna. I also want to thank the professors that helped us out along the way with this project. So Dr. Aaron Bloomfield, Dr. Jeffrey Evansek, Dr. Jeffrey Rohde, and Dr. Patrick Flaherty. I want to thank my university, so Duquesne University and the chemistry department, as well as our funding sources, so the NIH and the NSF, as well as the Charles Henry Leach II Foundation. Last but not least, I want to thank all of you for listening. And I also would like to thank uh, Matthew again for inviting me. This was incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, for this nice talk. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe our YouTube channel or follow us in Twitter.